Yes. Brilliant. I'm not going to use the little microphone because I'm still coughing and I'm worried that I'm just going to like blast everybody if I have to cough. But if you can't hear me, just kind of wave your hands and I'll try and shout a little bit louder. Um, right. Just going to find my bit of paper in case there's any dates that I'm supposed to remember. I think, fortunately, I don't have to, which is great. Dates are like the one thing that I never remember. Um, yeah, so basically when we had 20 minutes, I realised I've used like so many seconds, so many of my 600 seconds have just been wasted then. Um, I was going to kind of bring more Stonehenge into this and then I was like, well, Stonehenge is boring. I'm gonna, we're going to move up north slightly um, and a little bit into Kent and uh, go to our friends Hengist and Horsa um, instead. So, um, basically, uh, what I'm going to try and quite quickly talk about today is two examples of um, heritage sites, uh, archaeological monuments. One is associated with uh, Horsa, um, which has had quite a lot of uh, work and interest in it, both from archaeology uh, the far right and people trying to counter that narrative um, and then one um, for Hengist which hasn't had the same attention um, and I think possibly because it doesn't exist anymore um, but uh, I thought I'd start just with like if anything can tell you about how people even you know a few hundred years ago were seeing Hengist and Horsa and the founding of the English race and all of that nonsense is Thomas Jefferson's proposal that Hengist and Horsa be on the seal of the United States uh, because they have the honour of being descended from them and their political principles. Um, well, if you read Geoffrey of Monmouth's version of how Hengist and Horsa, especially Hengist, <coughs> end up in England and getting some land, it's not exactly complimentary now, of course, Geoffrey is coming from that Britonic <coughs> uh, William the Conqueror's side, uh, you know, he is writing a British history, but, but British as Britonic um, and not really English, um, but they definitely don't have good political principles. Um, Hengist rocks up, he tricks his way into a marriage between his daughter and the king, he tricks his way into getting more land than was technically on offer. Um, and he tricks his way into murdering quite a lot of the British nobles at the site which eventually will become Stonehenge. So they're not exactly the political principles that I myself would want to be associated with. Um, but I think we all know enough about Thomas Jefferson to perhaps think he was probably quite keen on all of that stuff. Um, so I... Uh, Horses Grave, which I'll come on to really shortly, uh, is a site uh, in Kent. Uh, Hengist, on the other hand, in the national kind of narrative, doesn't necessarily have a burial site. Um, if you go on the brilliant website findagrave.com, um, <laughs> he's apparently buried in the ruins of St. Augustine's Abbey in Canterbury, which I'm not really sure how that's ended up there. It's a bit of nonsense. Um, you can also, I highly recommend, you read the flowers, which are little comments that people have left uh, under this uh, page, which is like, ah, oh, I'm placing a flower at the grave, the, the, the imaginary grave, of my 52 times great-grandfather, Hengist, King of Kent. <laughs> I mean, it's brilliant. And um, yeah, there's 33, and some of them are just flowers, but some of them are genuinely hilarious comments. Um, and I, you know, uh, so Horses Grave, as I said, is in Kent, it's supposedly in Kent, supposedly one of the Medway megaliths. Um, if you're seeing a horse in the shape of that stone, I think you have far more imagination than I do. I never have seen a horse in it, but that's the story. It's the white horse stone and it's the grave of Hengist. Um, it's never mentioned particularly uh, Bede says Hengist is buried in the east of Kent. It's not identified as a place until the 1800 when Lampreys says actually it's that white stone horse stone that everyone knows about. Um, and it's quite quickly, uh, kind of in from the 60s, 80s onwards, been guarded by the guardians of the white stone who in their picture on their website look like lovely, friendly people. <laughs> Have some very interesting views about the symbolic birthplace of the English nation, which is this stone somebody sprayed a bit of 
runes onto in a field in Kent. Um, and I've just put down at the bottom uh, two really interesting uh, pieces of research, uh, kind of interaction with heritage that people have done recently. Uh, so I'm not going to quickly skip on to my own research, get out of the white stone out of the way. Um, but a spot called Crayford is particularly interesting. It's Fran Olfrey, who's at King's, I think. Um, she's just finishing up her PhD. And basically she took some, uh, a group of school children from um, Kent and they explored the Anglo-Saxon landscape of Hengist and Horsa uh, in relation to nationalism. Um, and she wrote a blog about it, which is just at the bottom of that slide. Right, so anyway, where is Hengist actually buried? According to Geoffrey of Monmouth, he is buried at Collingsborough Castle in Yorkshire, uh, sort of near uh, Rotherham and Doncaster. Um, and he's buried in a barrow by the uh, British King Aurelius, who has executed him for being a pretty nasty chap. Well, he personally doesn't do it, but he buries him um, in this barrow, which is supposed to be at Coningsborough Castle. Um, it was there in the 1800s, if you read Ivanhoe, it mentions it, um, but the barrow itself, certainly no mound exists anymore. Um, but Coningsborough is an interesting place, and it has a connection to the Anglo-Saxon, which Geoffrey is exploiting through his connection between the castle and Hengist, because before the conquest, <coughs> it belonged to Harold Godwinson. Um, and at Coningsborough Castle, they have this incredible uh, interpretation of the story about from Geoffrey of Monmouth, written by somebody who doesn't appear to have read the passage in Geoffrey. Um, so there's a great line, a kind of misreading, if they have read it, about uh, Aurelius as Ambrosius Aurelianus, which is his name in Nennius, um, so a much earlier text. Uh, and he is the son of some Romans in Nennius. Geoffrey gets rid of all that entirely because um, he's doing something very different with his description of Hengist's burial that has no particular relation to the Roman Empire, although it does uh, relate to, as somebody mentioned, William the Conqueror um, and kind of his connection to a biblical past. Um, but I just think it's really interesting that the mound is a symbol of a victorious ancient empire, which is not the British or English empire, although despite the fact it's created by, in Geoffrey at least, a British king, um, but the Roman Empire, which obviously was a huge favourite of um, the Victorians uh, in their own empire building. So um, things that I'm kind of looking at from this um, is if Hengist's burial, because it's um, kind of, it's not there anymore and it doesn't, incredibly doesn't have this connection with the far right in a way that you think it would. You'd think that they would be really keen to get out there and find, you know, Hengist's burial, but no, they've got Horsa and I guess they're happy with that. Um, <coughs> but um, I'm sort of interested in how we can use um, interpretations of these type sites from the past to diversify and develop heritage interpretation in a way that perhaps tells the truth or um, at least gets its facts right more than the Comics for Interpretation Board, which I have to say was not made by English heritage. <coughs> um, but these are kind of some of the problems I'm thinking about at the minute, how we use medieval literature and perhaps a little bit of folklore um, to conquer some of the problems, but also things that trip us up the way that heritage is divided. So we have English heritage who are focusing on, naturally on English sites. So, um, so how do they kind of take the Britishness or the exoticness uh, in, in Stonehenge's case, which comes to England via Africa and Ireland um, and kind of develop that more for the public um, in order to get rid of this mysterious and unknown quality um, to a lot of the sites which the public love, the public love a mystery, but unfortunately in the case of a lot of these archaeological sites that allows a void into which the kind of insidious and often far-right narratives are and have for you know hundreds of years been creeping in. Um, so yeah I'd welcome if people want to tweet ideas of how I can try <coughs> to develop it further I would love that or email me. Thank you.